Hi! Hi! When I put on my plant-provided shoes and first stepped foot into the Chernobyl exclusion zone, the first thing to greet me was a surprisingly healthy-looking dog. And then another. And then another. Curious white, black, and brown mutts followed us through Pripyat and waited for treats just outside the sarcophagus. Large pod puppies bounded blissfully on contaminated concrete. I would later learn that this large population of dogs was possibly descended in part from the pets left behind after the nearby reactor number four exploded almost four decades prior. It was quite the experience, petting possibly the world's rarest dogs in the shadow of the world's worst nuclear disaster. It made an impression on me. So much so that I became an ambassador for the Clean Futures Fund a nonprofit that does their best to track and maintain Chernobyl's dog population. Together, you helped us raise over $62,000, the single largest donation in the history of the Dogs of Chernobyl program. Thank you. This video will be the first update after that amazing effort, what your donations have helped us do, and it will be another humble request. I want to raise another $40,000 and push the total to over 100000 it's an arbitrary milestone, but a good one. Together, we can help manage and preserve what I see as a unique and undeniably adorable piece of history that has much to teach us. And if you want the dog's full story first, consider watching our full Expedition Chernobyl series. Counterintuitively, keeping a large population of former pets healthy means making sure that their numbers don't get too large too fast. Many viewers were confused about this in the previous video, suggesting that human intervention is the worse option. It's not. Hundreds of wild dogs roam the 2,600 square kilometers of the Chernobyl exclusion zone, but if there were many thousands, food would be even scarcer than it already is. Shelter from harsh Ukrainian winters would be even harder to find, and inevitable inbreeding would introduce genetic abnormalities more immediately damaging than anything from ambient radiation. So, spaying and neutering Chernobyl's dogs is one of CFF's many missions, a mission that they are doing their best to continue during Russian invasion. In fact, their last mission, just a few weeks ago, had to be a secret one. Hi, I'm Dr. Betts, the veterinary medical director for Dogs of Chernobyl program with the Clean Futures Fund. Last October, Veterinary medical director and CFF board member Dr. Jennifer Betts was worried that inbreeding was getting worse in the Ukrainian woods. Food was getting low, shelters were degrading. And so without informing anyone, Dr. Betts and a small team of volunteers flew to Poland and then took a long train ride into the exclusion zone with only a few days to act. They caught wild dogs in Chernobyl City, checked up on the dogs that live near the sarcophagus, genetically. These are the dogs most similar to the pets left behind in 1986. And they even offered free veterinary services to the people living in Slavutich, the town that houses most of Chernobyl's workers. They also trained a local surgeon to do operations on larger dogs, something previously he wasn't very confident in. All in all, your donations made it possible to quickly and quietly address the medical needs of 233 dogs and cats in Ukraine. Now that might not sound like a lot, but it's a significant percentage of the embattled population there. Your money went towards painkillers for the operation, flea and tick medication, 800 kilograms of food a week, and medical supplies for the human firefighters and frontline soldiers there. You are helping Clean Futures Fund and myself make a mark on history that I do think needs preserving. The long-term stewardship of Chernobyl's dogs is a unique opportunity to study the long-term effects of radioactive contamination on large mammals, science that could one day extend to humans. And some of that science has already begun. In the March of 2023, scientists, Dr. Betts of the CFF was one of them, released the first genetic characterization of a domestic species, dogs, in Chernobyl. Up until then, most of the studies looking into the health effects of exposure to long-term, low-dose ionizing radiation and other contaminants focused on smaller organisms or organisms without backbones, organisms that are much harder, if not impossible, to compare to humans. 
And so before anyone can address questions of possible evolutionary adaptation to radiation, for example, we need a complete picture of a population's genetics. You won't be able to tell, for example, if the genome of a population of dogs has changed significantly because of a highly mutagenic environment or simply because of a lack of genetic partners, if you don't know what the genomes look like in the first place. The Chernobyl dog study was a first attempt at this. And though the big newsworthy conclusions can't be made yet, we do know that there are genetically distinct populations of dogs living in the exclusion zone. Some of them, evidence indicates, might indeed be direct descendants from the pets that escaped disaster in 1986. The dogs of Chernobyl, the study concludes, are of immense scientific relevance for understanding the impact of harsh environmental conditions on wildlife and humans alike, particularly the genetic health effects of exposure to long-term, low-dose ionizing radiation and other contaminants." End quote. Preserving this population of dogs, as the CFF seeks to, could lead to real scientific insight and have real, actionable conclusions for environmental resource management and remediation techniques. Your support, therefore, has potential benefits beyond simply supplying kibble for heart-meltingly cute pup yats and prip yats, as I insist on calling them. More science and more science communication is desperately needed in Chernobyl, something that you can help with. It's a unique environment that can tell us how organisms actually interact with radiation in an uncontrolled environment, and good communication is needed to get those facts out to the public. For example, take this study about tree frogs in the exclusion zone. Its fascinating finding was that these particular amphibians had predictable skin coloration based on how far they were located from reactor number four at the time of the disaster, 37 years ago, and not based on how much radiation present populations are currently absorbing. Quote, it is thus plausible that selective processes acting on existing color variability favored individuals with darker coloration. Fascinating, but misinterpreted in many outlets that said that frogs are currently changing color in response to current radiation levels. The study does not say this. This isn't the most critical correction, but it does affect public understanding of Chernobyl, natural selection, and the dangers of radiation, or not. The continued study of the dogs will also add more strokes to the controversial picture being painted of Chernobyl's wildlife generally. Is the exclusion zone a mutagenic wasteland? Or is it a haven where animals now thrive? There is actually no scientific consensus here because both viewpoints are true in part. Human civilization radically changes any ecosystem. It consumes, it pollutes, it expands. According to the World Wildlife Fund, species populations have declined by more than half since 1970. And so when 50,000 people suddenly vanished overnight from what would become the Chernobyl exclusion zone in 1986, the local ecosystem clearly bounced back. No cars, no hunters, no ever-increasing concrete jungle. At the same time, however, that ecosystem was burdened with a chronic case of low-dose ionizing radiation. Which of these two conditions, the lack of humans or gross nuclear contamination, ultimately dominates the current and future state of Chernobyl's wildlife is still an open question. And the communication of this uncertainty, good and bad, will affect how people think about nuclear disasters generally. The study of Chernobyl's wildlife could also end up being the most important data point in another controversy, whether or not long-term, low-dose ionizing radiation has an appreciable health effect on humans. Like the state of the Ukrainian woods 150 kilometers north of Kyiv, there are two schools of thought on this. One is the so-called threshold model, which posits that underneath a certain threshold, usually listed as 100 microsieverts per year, low doses of ionizing radiation are basically harmless, possibly even slightly beneficial in some cases, because the body already has the molecular machinery to repair this damage. The other model, the linear no threshold model, is exactly what it sounds like. The health effects of ionizing radiation is linear from zero, 
any radiation will have some effect no matter how small. Complicating this controversy among clinicians, physicists, and lawmakers further is the practical fact that one model, the more debated linear no-threshold model, is much easier to create regulations around and to use for comparing different levels of radiation generally. It's the underlying assumption behind every radiation infographic you've ever seen. But while the LN team model may be useful for regulation, it may have also created a widespread irrational fear of low-level radiation that persists to this day to cause more health effects than low-level radiation ever physically could. A comprehensive study covered in 2005 concluded that, quote, the mental health impact of Chernobyl is the largest public health problem unleashed by the accident to date, end quote. Forced evacuations after the 1986 explosion led to well-documented social isolation, anxiety, depression, psychosomatic medical problems, reckless behavior, and suicides in Ukraine. In Italy and Switzerland, the public was so afraid of possible radiation blowing their way as minuscule as it would have been, and so misinformed about the danger of that radiation that birth rates there actually declined for a time. And that's because pregnant mothers were electively aborting their babies. This is the largest documented effect of the Chernobyl disaster on the unborn. There were no detectable changes in births or babies due to low-level radiation. In retrospect, one study concludes, the widespread fear in the population about the possible effects of exposure on the unborn was not justified. This has to be one of the worst outcomes of incomplete or misleading public communication that I can think of, and you've probably never even heard of it, precisely because irrational fears cast a shadow over these forgotten consequences to this day. There aren't any humans living legally in the Chernobyl exclusion zone to study. Children aren't playing in the grass, fathers aren't walking the city streets, mothers aren't breastfeeding babies. But Chernobyl's dogs are doing all of those things. There isn't another easily accessible population of mammals quite like them, and as such, they represent one of the best ways to answer questions about long-term, low-level irradiation, mutation, and adaptation genetic and otherwise. This is why I see real merit in what the Clean Futures Fund is doing, and I hope that you do too. I won't deny that some of this charity is self-serving. I make money from making videos, and I'd like to go back to Chernobyl to make more videos, while personally helping the dogs program. Hopefully, when Ukraine takes back its territory, I will be able to join the CFF on a trip and give you another first-hand pup date. With or without me, however, more work needs to be done, and I'm asking you to be a part of it. Animals have to be tagged, vaccinated, and treated. Kennels have to be upgraded. Isolation facilities need to be built. For now, for safety, donating here is the best way to support this effort. And if you're still not convinced, please enjoy a montage of brand new photos of tiny little cute puppies taken just a few weeks ago, set to semi-sad music. I know what I'm doing. It's for charity. Deal with it. Until next time.